All right, we're going to go back to John chapter number six. And the theme tonight is a theme that we have touched on before. And I want to pose this question to you because this is something that you need to wrestle with. And maybe you got settled in your heart. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Can a Christian lose their salvation? Here in John chapter 6, we find the truth that our Lord and Savior is given to us to be able to ponder, to be able to be encouraged, equipped by, and to be assured. When someone places their faith and trust in Jesus, we believe that Jesus forgives all sin, amen? Past, present, and even future sins that they would commit. When someone receives Christ as Savior, as we've been teaching, it is by the grace of God Almighty. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. A man could not save himself no more than a man could swim across the ocean. He can try, but somewhere along the line he might sink. But because God is able to save unto the uttermost, the invitation is still out. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want you to know that there is a lot of information available through the writings of authors, various uh, professors of theology and biblical truths that are there available on the internet. For all of us, there is a controversy. These are controvers controversial truths. Some would suggest that a man can lose his salvation because he sins against God. Now, I would agree that Christians still sin because none of us are perfect. Amen. We have a sin nature, but when we get saved, we get a new nature. So we are constantly reminded uh, in our lives, as we read the Word of God, that life is about choices. I can choose to yield my life to the sinful nature, that old nature, or I can choose to yield my life to Jesus Christ and the will of God and the Holy Spirit of God. And when I do that, I feel better about myself. Some would suggest that some people are not saved because they went into a backslidden state. This is where a lot of controversy comes up. So-and-so, my brother say, but he's living in a life of drunkenness and alcoholism and debauchery. Is it true that we as Christians can still make choices that our Heavenly Father would not be proud of? If it's true that I'm saved by the grace of God, then it's true that I can make choices after my salvation, though I may be grieving the Holy Spirit. Though I may be quenching the Spirit of God living with me, it's true that I can live a life that, ex that exhibits the behavior of a person that probably does not know God. Ha like example A, have you ever cursed since you've been saved? Guilty. Have you ever thought a bad thought in your life? Guilty. So those are some examples. I've said this before that I could leave this pulpit. I pray I'll never do it. I don't believe I'll ever do it. I'm not planning on it. And But I could leave this pulpit and go by a liquor store and purchase something that could get me inebriated. I'm not planning on doing it. Would I still be saved? Pose in question. Would I still be saved if I did so? According to the testimony of the Word of God, once you come into faith in Jesus Christ, God forgives you of all sin. I may lose the joy of my salvation, but I don't live, lose the relationship because it's eternal. Now, there are many also that believe that someone can lose their salvation. And by the way, there is still hope for our loved ones that have professed to know Christ. Maybe they're not living the way they should. And I would suggest to you that they're not happy, that they're grieving the Spirit of God. I have recently talked to a man who has strayed away from God, but now he has renewed uh, belief in the Lord and the Word of God, and his life is beaming, and he's concerned about the fact that he, wanna, he don't want to miss out on any eternal rewards. Because he recognizes 
what the Word of God says. There are some that will suggest that some people are not saved because they don't go to a particular, let's say, church, Baptist church. Now, in the Word of God, we are told that believers met everywhere, right? Uh, In synagogues, on the seashore, uh, in people's homes. A building is not the church. Uh, The church are those that have been born again, that have been saved by the wonderful grace of God. Example A, I have five children. My children don't live in my household like they used to. Thank God they've grown up to some degree physically, and they are doing whatever they're doing tonight. But they're still my children. When, When God births a individual into his family, they can go various directions, and they may not geographically and be sitting in a church. It's better if they're growing in, in grace and, and obeying the scriptures like Hebrews 10, 25. But, but because you don't see them inside a church house does not mean they're not born again. They're not saved. And those are, those are just a few. There are many ideas. Uh, they take Hebrews chapter 6 out of context. Uh, they take the fact that Listen, uh, we're, if you're not showing enough good works, maybe you're not born again. You're not saved. And uh, no one can do enough good. Who has the list on the to-do good list of works we should do? But if we yield ourselves to the, to the Word of God and yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God, it won't surprise me that God will lead you to be the light and the salt and to, and to do the many wonderful things that we can do. Uh, yesterday at the reception, I told Betty that I, I just saw all the all the work of the people that labored behind the scenes. They looked so beautiful, the layout and the food that was eaten. It was just delicious. And I just thought somebody had to do all that work, right? Somebody had the labor behind the scenes. And when it comes to salvation, many prayers have gone out. Many invitations have been said and good deeds have been done in the body of Christ in the effort and the hopes and the prayer that one person, perhaps a mother, a dad, a brother or a sister might come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so when I think about what we're going to study tonight, uh, we're going to just give you the introduction next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to give you more biblical truths on this subject. But let's begin in verse 37 through verse 40. I said, I will park at these verses Because there's some doctrinal issues that I think we need to go back and visit. Beginning with verse 37 of John 6. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will, this is the Father's will which sent me. That of all which he hath given me. I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up again the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which see the Son and believe it on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise it up at the last day. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises that you've made. We thank you that you're faithful and true. Now we ask that you will use your word once again to help us understand how marvelous and how great your salvation is and how dear we can trust you and believe you continually. Now, I pray that you'll use your word to encourage us and to help us continue to trust you for greater things. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have three thoughts taken from the verses that we want to share tonight. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Salvation is a gift from God. Salvation means to be delivered from. We are delivered from the wrath to come. Do you understand that every person you meet is going to face the Creator God one day on Judgment Day, and if they're not saved, they will face God Almighty And and as the scripture tells us, since they didn't put their faith and trust in Jesus while they had time, 
they will be cast into an everlasting fire. Now that's a warning to all of us. We are like firemen that somebody's house is on fire spiritually. Uh, We need to take the good news and try to share it with them before it's eternally too late. But we that are saved, as John records for us, we pass from death unto life. Now the Spirit of God lives within the sight of us, and we shall never thirst, we shall never hunger. In other words, God is able to quench that innermost soul, that desire that you have, that thing that you thought maybe you were missing. God is able to satisfy that longing. Notice three thoughts why you cannot lose your salvation. First of all, look at verse 37. Because he has promised he will not cast you out. He has promised he will not cast you out. All that the Father given me, this is Jesus speaking, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The word cast out means to throw, to put out. It means to banish. It means to reject. Once you are in the family of God, there is no casting out of the family of God. And all we can say is, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. When you come to Jesus, He doesn't give you temporary life. And isn't it interesting if we could simply read the words of Jesus? If you sin, you lose your salvation or you lose the forgiveness. That would have been clear. That would be clearly understood. But over and over again, the idea that if you believe in him, you have everlasting life. You did nothing to earn it. Like the other day when we came to the services here. And um, I would say one of the weaknesses that I've had in my life is chocolate. Chocolate and chips, right? And so when uh, our dear sister Karina was passing out the gifts that day, I was standing here in the pulpit area, and she came to me, and she handed me the gift box of chocolate. And um, you say, Brother Byron, did you have to vacuum her carpet at her house? Did you have to shine her windows in her home? No, no, no. Simply received it. A picture of salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There are many people that struggle with this. Some have actually been disciplined. I think biblical church discipline is scriptural, something that we practice over the years. And uh, people have lost membership. You may lose membership, but you will not lose salvation if you are born again. I want to bring a biblical example of this. Look in John chapter number 9. This will be a current day attendant of church for this man. John chapter number 9, verse 22. This is about the man who was blind and from his birth, and now he receives sight because of Jesus. Verse 22 of John chapter number 9. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that any man did confess that he was the Christ, referring to Jesus, Christ means Messiah, anointed one, he should be put out of the synagogue. In in our current day vernacular, if you believe on Jesus, (laughs) you should be put out of the church. It's about works doctrine for them. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. (laughs) They're still called Jesus a sinner and other things. He answered and said, Whether it be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Let me pause right there. When you got saved, maybe you said with your own words, Now I see. Now I see it's not joining the church. Now I see that that my salvation is not based upon how I live or whether I attend the church, but our salvation is based on Jesus and him alone. Verse 26, then said they to him again, what did he did? What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he rehearses 
And he answered and said, I told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, will you hear that again? And will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, and we are Moses' disciples. Oh, yeah? We know that Moses spake unto Moses, for we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that if any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Was thou altogether born in sins? Dost thou teach us? And they, what? Cast him out. The reason I'm bringing that is because here on earth, many professing Christians have dealt with issues within a body of church, body of believers. Uh, maybe they were doing drugs and alcohol and brotherly kindness. Maybe the leadership or maybe some brothers in the church said, brother so-and-so is continuing to drink publicly and he doesn't want to repent of their sins. And the Bible tells us to confront our brother in love and admonish him and restore that brother. That's the ultimate goal. But there will come a time when church discipline may be executed or put in place. In this case, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. The man gets kicked out of the synagogue that he attended for having faith and trust in Jesus. We as believers, will never be cast out of the family of God. We might experience ups and downs in churches we attend, but we cannot lose our salvation. In John chapter number 10, verse 27, Jesus comparing to us like sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. So our Lord Jesus is telling us, reassuring us, there ain't nobody, no man can pluck you out of his hands. You are in the hands of God as a child of God. Isn't that comforting? Isn't that wonderful? That not even the devil himself, though he is up to his dirty schemes, not even sinful man can pluck me out of my father's hands. In 2 Corinthians, we're reminded that the God of this world had blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the glorious gospel, which is the image of God, should shine upon their own hearts. Now, looking at the Word of God, we do know this, there are a lot of people out there that say this to believers, because we're not perfect. They say things like this, well, I saw so-and-so smoking cigarettes. Okay, let's take that example. Back in the early part of our country, many professing Christians were smokers, smokers of tobacco. It's not a good example. You know, some, some have suggested, will smoking send you to hell? No, but it'll make you smell like you've been there maybe, right? But what should we say to those that say and accuse us of sinning? Well, we need to remind them. I may have said something. I may have done something. But that if they offended you, I apologize. Please forgive me. And there's a time to humble ourselves for our actions. But the truth of the matter is, is that all Christians still are capable and do sin. So what should we do? First John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. There's, there's the desire of our Heavenly Father. There's the standard, if you please. That if you could live your life since you've been saved without doing it wrong, Man, you earn a medal. You earn a trophy. And I hope you hope you show a lot. A, your life has been changed by the power of God. But he goes on to say, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In John chapter number 1, we are reminded 
if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I've said this before. I thank God that I'm saved. I thank the Lord for allowing me to hear the gospel. I thank God for the Holy Spirit that convicted me that I was a sinner. I thank God for all the spiritual blessings. But since I've been saved, I have made decisions that were not pleasing unto my Lord. And you say, what did you do? I confess my sin. I acknowledge them to my heavenly father. And the Bible says we have an advocate. That's like a mediator. That's a lawyer. And our lawyer intercedes on our behalf for our own benefit and blessing. A lot of Christians will be accused. Uh, listen, I'm sure you get tempted by everything you do in life. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. One thing I've never seen in the Old Testament in the ministry of Jesus, I've never seen him kick out someone, cast out someone. I have, however, as we will see further in the end of John chapter number six, people walking away from Jesus, people turning their back on Jesus. And so what Jesus has for us is eternal. We cannot lose our salvation because Jesus will not cast you out. Secondly, because Jesus will not lose a soul that has come to faith in him. Look at verse 39. And this is the Father's will which sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Underscore the word, I should lose nothing. Nothing. When you do a word study on this word, lose nothing, it means to destroy fully. One man named Albert Barnes stated that the Christian will die. His body will return to corruption, yet he will not be destroyed. The Redeemer will watch over him and through his grave and keep him to the resurrection of the just. Now, this is encouraging to me because when I think about it, unless the rapture happens, when people die, they are either buried traditionally, that is, they may be put six foot under, um, and uh, their body will go in the grave. The body will decompose. We all understand that, right? Our body will turn into dust. Some people will have their body frozen. They'll have a special arrangement for their body to be placed in some cooler somewhere. Scary thought while people are working on science and and all kind of ideas. Can you imagine yourself coming out, you know, having to live and, and know they couldn't change all the wrinkles and things and all the deformities. But you could live, right? It could be like monsters on planet Earth. And that's a scary thing to anticipate, but there are some people that have their bodies frozen. But there's another group, and that is a group that many today are having their bodies cremated. Loved ones don't want to have to go through all the things, and so they're honoring the the parents' wishes, perhaps, or maybe the individuals chose to do this, or maybe they didn't know what to do, and so they have their their bodies uh, uh, cremated. And what that does, it causes the body to be burnt to the point that it's basically ashes. And ashes are put in a urn somewhere, a container, and a lot of people hold on to that uh, ashes in their home, and and they acknowledge that. But when you die, and when I die, where does the soul go? Does the soul stay in the grave? This is what Jesus is talking about, that he will not lose anything. Whoever you are, Your body may decompose, but God has not forsaken you. The real you, the real real will be reconciled with God. How does he do that? Well, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, turn there for a moment. And we won't spend a lot of time here, but the Apostle Paul reminds us that there will be a resurrection. And uh, God is not going to lose any one of us. That is, he's not going to destroy us, including our soul. 
There is someone that we should fear, someone that we should be concerned about destroying us, and that's God himself. But I love what 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 51, this is often read at a funeral. Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. That's another word to, to die. But we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And the reason I'm bringing this passage up is because those that have already died in the Lord, those that are in the grave, their body is corrupting. Their body has decayed. But for the believer, it's not the end of life. It's not the end of a story. When someone died, it's not the end of life. In Acts chapter number 1, we are told after our Lord was here on the earth, and after he went to the cross of Calvary and shed his blood to pay for sins and was buried and rose again, he appeared to the believers at that time. And Acts 1 verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them which they should not depart from Jerusalem, <clears throat> but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me of John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When therefore they were come together to ask of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the season which the Father had put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now the reason I'm bringing this up to you is because after Jesus Christ was crucified, they took his body off that cross and laid him in a tomb, right? They laid him in a cave. And up from the grave he arose. Jesus is the example. And in the fact that he has all power, if he could conquer death and the grave, can we trust him that he should lose nothing? And I submit to you, we can. Luke chapter number 9, verse 56 says, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And he went to another village. There's another flip side to this coin, and that is a religion that does not honor and line up with the principles of the Word of God. And you might say that Satan is the mastermind religious leader of all time. Jesus said this concerning the devil. And he said in John 10, 10, the thief not cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Pray tell me according to the Bible, when someone dies without knowing Jesus as Savior, what happens to them? Well, the same thing that happens to everybody in this way. Their body goes in the grave unless they go by way of, of, of being frozen or being <clears throat> um, burned in the ashes. But ultimately, what happens to their soul? They will face God at judgment. They will be held accountable because they rejected the Son of God. Not we. We that are saved have passed from death into life, and the Lord will lose nobody. He will not destroy you to an everlasting fire. In Second Thessalonians, concerning the unbeliever, then shall that wicked be revealed, speaking of the devil, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I had an interesting conversation with our guest today. And this man was raised in Hopi, Hopi, Arizona. 
and part Hopi and part Navajo. He was telling me a lot of stories about what the pe traditional people and the superstition of what they believe. And uh, I said, you know, being superstitious is just like being Shaco. You live in fear all the time. You're worried about a cat, the dog. You're worried about food, et cetera, et cetera. And, and he began to share with me how on uh, First Mesa and some of the belief systems that the devil lives under there. And I, and I, and I said, you know what? One of the things that sure has helped me as a believer is to recognize the only person that I really need to fear in life is not man or not things that man can conjure up, but it's our creator God. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the what? The soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I have some real good news for you because you're saved. Your body may corrupt, be corrupted, but your soul is saved. And one day God is going to change that in the resurrection of the just and unjust. And your body will be raised into immortality. And, and God is going to do a wonderful, wonderful work. And God is going to keep his word. And he will lose nothing. He will destroy nothing. You will be saved. So looking at the word of God, I can be assured that I won't lose my salvation because Jesus won't cast me out. Lastly, look back to John chapter number 6, verse 39. Here's the third reason I want to submit to you tonight from our text. That you cannot lose your salvation because he has promised that he will raise you up. This is mentioned two times in verse 39. He said, but should raise it up, refer to you, and again at the last day. Verse 40, and this is the will of him which, that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, it sounds like a fiction, sounds like a fairy tale to some degree, because none of us have seen him. But if you were d there during the time of Christ, you if you were to look on the hill of Golgotha, the place of the skull, you would have saw our Lord Jesus alongside two thieves. And when he gave those final words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he gave up the ghost. He died. We would have saw that it was a very dark day. And we would have observed from a distance two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, get in that body plus the women that followed later on, and they would have taken his body to the grave. Then if we were like the disciples, we would have seen the Lord Jesus and the apostles as they met secretly for fear of the Jews. And after his resurrection, he appeared unto them and even challenged the believers to put their hand in his side. And when they recognized and believed that it was him, they worshiped the Savior. How could Jesus come out of that grave? Because he has more power than you and I are willing to believe he has. He has the power to not only save your soul, but he has the power to raise you bodily. Do you believe that? You believe that every grave will experience a resurrection of the dead? You witness it through the person of Jesus in the word of God, we are told in 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. I'm encouraged by that because the truth of the matter is I'm not looking necessarily to die, though it may happen. And I have no promise of another, another 24 hours. And as we said many times, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Amen. Paul mentions this in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15 through 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of our Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That is those that are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There will come a time of the resurrection of the dead. We studied this back in John chapter number 5. But two times here, Jesus speaks that all bodies will be raised. He will lose none of his. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus reminds us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath in himself life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which the, all that in the grace shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So let's review in closing. As the Word of God is taught tonight, and there are many other reasons and arguments, and we're going to try to get into that next Sunday night, okay? Outside of John chapter number 6. But looking at the text here, Three reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. Because Jesus will not cast you out. You're part of his family forever. Secondly, because Jesus will lose nothing. You are going to be changed miraculously. And God is not going to destroy your body. And you receive a glorified body one day. And thirdly, because Jesus will raise you up. I thought of this many times. I thought of many people that have been in different wars. And as I look in the book of Revelation, you can not only but think there could be total annihilation of islands because of atomic nuclear wars going on. And I understand even this past week that hearts were getting a little anxious and minds were getting anxious because of what was happening in Ukraine. Ukraine, But This should not surprise us as we look into the word of God preceding the coming of our Lord. It's not going to get better. It's going to get what? It's going to get worse. And there'll be signs and wonders which will, which all people here on planet earth will face. But one thing is for sure. And we don't know when that will be. The Lord will come back after seven years of tribulation. But here's the thing that I want to, close with you can be rest assured you can have blessed assurance as we have seen that if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus your soul is eternally secure in him now church membership that's questionable Uh, like the man in the synagogue people have experienced different problems your lifestyle Unless you're Jesus, I suspect you and I are not perfect. We are saved by the grace of God, right? But I can believe Jesus and I can thank him that he will not cast me out. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I am no not wise, cast out. He will not destroy. He will not lose anyone. And that one day... He will raise your body if you should pass off the scene and someone to lay you and bury you. There will come a time that God through his infinite power will raise you to a body that's immortal, incorruptible. I like to think of the body that we'll have like Jesus. In heaven, we'll still get to eat, amen? A body that will never get tired. Think about it. Uh, a body that will never grow old. And we can all say hallelujah to that. Amen. And uh, thank God for the promises of our Lord. And I thank him for his truth tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for eternal, everlasting life. 
that you promise for us. Thank you that you made provision. Should we fall, stumble, sin, disobey you, that you have an advocate, that we can seek restoration, fellowship with you. Thank you that a just man falls seven times and Lord, you are able to raise him up again. Thank you for these precious promises. Now, God, we ask that you use this truth to continue to encourage us and remind us of your wonderful salvation. And Lord, if there's anyone here listening who has yet to receive you, put their trust in you. May they do so tonight before it's eternally too late. And we'll thank you for that. Amen.